Good evening, welcome to episode 166 of the Brugaders, the Beer and Comics podcast. Uh, I was playing around with the idea of like the beer and comics and a sort of geekery podcast, but then it'll eventually just be like a list of shit that we just talk about, like and this and this and this. <laughs> well, yeah, welcome to the Brugaders. Uh, I am Jeff, and joined to my right is uh, Mister Lagerlogs himself, Stu. Hello. And I think we're okay now, but there was like a there is a wee delay going on between me and Stu, so I've like um apologies for that. Hmm. Well, it says we've only been live for twenty seconds, but I feel like I've been talking much longer than twenty seconds. So yeah, mine's the same forty five seconds. Oh, f- <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Uh, so yeah, um, tonight uh, we we were hopefully going to be joined by Tony Foster tonight, but he's um mm-hmm. we were unable to um make our diaries match up. I wasn't very well this week and stuff. So Tony's going to join us next week um, to talk to us about the um, Kirk Newton comic exhibition and the amazing comic event that he's going to be hosting in Livingston in March. So yeah, I'm excited for that. Um, Also, we've not got Andrew with us today because it's his birthday. So happy birthday, Mr. McGee. Yes, happy birthday. Uh, uh, Hello, Neil. Um, Neil happens to be the owner of our most watched uh, YouTube video ever for the Brugaders. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. He stole the sir. show. He did. Um, we, um, obviously, for those that were watching last week, Neil um, was gracious enough to contribute to the podcast and we tried to play it, but um, the Gremlins got in the way. But so it was, we published it independently on YouTube. And yeah, it's our, uh, like, YouTube went fucking mental with it. Like, it was just like, well, well done. You know, like <laughs> do this eighty percent more, and you you will become monetized in that. And just ran like you know, like when mm-hmm. something like starts to happen, YouTube starts to take notice. So, yeah, thank you, Fanny. E indeed. So keep them coming, keep them coming. Mm-hmm. And anyone else wants to contribute? And uh, I don't know where Cranet is. So I think, I think somewhere. He's, he's where. But we miss you hugely. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna talk about beer. We're gonna talk about comics. Uh, I've got a list that I put together based on sort of participation by everyone. So I'm just going to read that and try and, yeah, I think that we yeah. had like journalism. <laughs> <laughs> I that's going to work out. Uh, but yeah, before that, beer, How, what have you got? Um, I have a bitter uh, from Backyard Brew House called oh, Wands. So where, where are Backyard Brew House based? Uh, they are. Uh, the Midlands, uh, Wal- Walsall. Oh, yeah. Aye. Uh, these were guys that we interviewed uh, on the Lagalogs podcast at Christmas. Um, it was a, uh, it was just some local boys to uh, Tom, my co-host. Nice. So yeah, they sent us some beer to try out. Uh, it, was, it was mostly to to kind of promote their Christmas beer, Bad Santa. But they gave us a couple IPAs and uh, bitters as well. Oh, nice! That's exciting. Um, mm-hmm. How is it? I, I've not opened it yet, but I'm going to. And the other one is a pilot beer. These are Edinburgh. Oh, guys. I love pilot. Uh, Basin, Basin Leith Pilot. Mm-hmm. Amber Jam. Well, well, I've not had that one before. That yeah. they have a, they have one I really like, which is like they do like a macchiato stout. Oh. It's really, really nice. Yeah. That sounds exquisite. And they're um, we I remember when we first kind of started the Brugaders, they were like the up and one of the up and coming sort of like I think they'd maybe just started to brew, and it was like their their media their social media presence is really quite good. Mm. Like, and um, it just sort of I remember me and uh, Colin doing one of our first sort of year crawls into Edinburgh after doing the podcast and mm-hmm. it was, uh, we were quite excited to see Pilot, I think they had it on tap of one of the like, oh, well, pretty cool. <laughs> nah, that's good. Nah, I've got a uh, I've got my last can, this is like my this is my go-to session beer ah. it's the Green, the Green King IPA, it's great yeah. on tap in Green King pubs um, it's relatively cheap in supermarkets and it's totally sessionable it's just a mm-hmm. It's like three point six percent, three pound seventy five for packs of four in Asda. Yeah, I got noticed they had it for like a pound a bottle, like singles. Um, it, it was one of my potential uh, bottles of beer for uh, beer wars, like the, the the competitive 
beer yeah. shopping thing that me and Tom do. But uh, I ended up spending three quid on a tin of four pure. Oh, yeah. Um, This? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I've not had much of four pure stuff. It, it shows up quite a lot in like beer boxes and stuff, doesn't it? Four yeah. Pure. And I was. It was in this Asda's. Oh God, what Asda was it? It was. Um, I think I was outside Cowden Beef or Burnt Island, and they've got oh, like God. a big one, uh, down there. So I just ended up buying all the beer for Beer Wars out of that. But they had like a really good craft selection. Yeah. But. Asda are killing it just now, actually. They, I, I live, I live walking okay. distance. Like maybe last night's car. Mm-hmm. That's, that actually looks really kind of clear and lively for a bitter. Yeah, totally. I would, yeah, I would have maybe thought that was an IPA or a lager, maybe. Because mm-hmm. I was, I was confused at first when it just says blonde on the bottle because I assumed yeah. well, it's a blonde ale, but no, it's a uh, blonde it's, bitter. Is that what they call yeah, it? Yeah, just uh, bitter, four point one percent, platinum blonde bitter, citrus, and a pine nose with a dry, crisp, and hoppy taste. Mm. Nice. Oh, that is hoppy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh. I mean, looking forward to just getting out about and drinking a wee bit more beer. Um, mm-hmm. I miss it. I miss my. I miss just. You know, I don't tend to drink better, but then if I'm in a pub and they've, you know, they've got something a wee bit fancier, like a fancier bitter, I don't yeah. necessarily care for best or anything, but. Mm-hmm. If I've got something, I'm like, oh, I've not tried that brewery or that. Like, um, I've not been out in pubs often enough to just play about with some more bittery stuff. But yeah, I mean that that's why I splurged when I was in uh, like Edinburgh that other week, and I was more or less just trying something I've not had before. So that's why I was like trying that Dundee Pale Ale from Moore, yeah. and just like, oh, I've not had that one. Perfect, half a pint of that, please. Just so I could kind of like almost take off all these ones, like all these boxes in my head. Obviously, I've tried that, tried that, I've tried that. Rather than just kind of sticking to like uh, Heineken, yeah. tenants. I was like, right, you're you're out. You don't get out often. This is it. Like dive into the unknown. <laughs> we certainly, uh, certainly in the early days of the podcast, that was very much something we like the original format of the Brugaders. So anybody that goes onto our YouTube, you can catch like our. Or go further enough down the YouTube channels, you can see on our early episodes. It was me and Colin in like the same space, and we would buy yeah. two cans each, which meant we yeah. got like and we, and we properly tasted and like did the plate around and did all the swirling with your hand and all that. Ah, shit. Of course, and, mm-hmm. um, it's not necessarily the requirement anymore. But um, and we used to do a couple of like we did two, and I've been on several things. That's why I'm quite excited about places like the Discovery Beer Place in Dundee opening up in that. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, a, Drinking um, Salt Horse in Edinburgh, Calder and Crafty Merchant, these bottle shops have got sitting spaces where you can sit and like buy mm-hmm. and drink off the shelf. You can do, I suppose you can do it in your house, but what we used to do is, if they say there was like a pub crawl, uh, we, we did a pub crawl starting there, but you say there were six of you and you all bought a different beer, then no. you, instead of like, you just like, just pass it around. And it meant that you were getting, you were still getting on it and you were still getting two or three beers, but you were getting, mm-hmm. you were getting, you were, you know, for the price of three beers, you were getting to, Taste eating. several, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, pretty cool. That's what I quite liked about uh, the, like the fierce bar because they done like the beer flights, so at least you got like four samples, yeah. And it's like, right, because whilst a honey stout sounds really good, I'm not sure if I'm ready to go for like commit to a half pint, yeah. But just getting like that little one third, it's good, just, just enough to kind of figure it like, aye or no, yeah. Went to um, is it Jocktoberfest? It's like the annual music festival that they have at they have at um, the um, Black Isle Brewery just north of Everness. Oh yeah. And I went there for a music festival, and they had their whole they had their whole tap line there. So there was like eighteen beers, and I remember going with my mate Steve. I don't know why we didn't consider like thirds or halves, but we yeah. just decided to start at the top of work our way down. And we yeah. got halfway and we're, uh, as you can imagine, a completely mortal, both of us. <laughs> and then obviously, uh, as we're enjoying like a pint, we would go back to that one. So I, do, I generally reckon that it was cheap because it was off the brewery. So I reckon it was mm-hmm. maybe about £3.50, £4 a pint of 
insanely good quality craft beer ever. I've never, I don't think I've ever been that drunk before. God, um, I can imagine. Yeah. So, uh, aye. Yeah, I'm trying to think what I um I haven't done got to do much drinking this week. Uh, I, I was going to go out last week, but my wee man was unwell again, so I, mm. I just been sort of crafting around the house and drinking that. I am looking forward to this. I picked this up in Asda, and then I don't know why I haven't read it, drank it yet. But um, they're a brewery you can find like uh, North Brewing Company. Oh yeah. So you were saying about the Asda are doing um really good. Mm. Uh, I started doing a, a, like quite a varied craft line. I mean, this is a six point five percent New England IPA, which is my favourite beer style anyway, as an IPA. No, um, but North are really good. Like if you go down south, but we were in Harrogate, not been in there yet actually, to be honest. But if you go down to Harrogate, they do have North have got like shops, like a bit like, like a bit like Brewdogs. Yeah. So um, you can go into you can go into a North. I think I think they're based in Leeds. I think that they're a Leeds brewery. Yeah. yeah. So um. But they've got um they've got venues in Leeds and like surrounding towns that mm. are very much like brew dogs. So um they do have good quality beer. So I'm quite excited about that one. That's my next beer. Um cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I that's it. I'm I'm away to Glasgow this weekend. So it's it's the same mindset of right, let's go to pubs, let's have a look at what they've got. And if there's bottle shops nearby, and heck, even if it's just like right, I'm going to like the Sainsbury's or the Tesco's on the corner. Let's just kind of see what beer they have on the shelves because sometimes it's completely different to what you have in Fife. Oh, totally. Um, I also just think I really like the um, I really like the. I always, I, I mentioned it quite a lot on the show, but it always kind of stuck by me. Is you've got um, we had Mark Abnett on, the um, comic creator, but he also works in the brewing industry, mm. where he works in sales for beers, and he is a uh, an advocate of the idea that if you look after your lines and stuff in a pub. So yeah. even just generic, generic lagers and generic ales can taste as good, or at least at a quality up there with like, you know, like if you go there and you're like, oh, I'm going to try something really special and quite premium. Aye. Yeah, he would argue that like a tenant can taste incredible if you look after all the the aspects. Yes, of Yes, that's it. You know, if your glass is clean, if the pipes are cleaned, if the yeah, you keep an eye on your equipment, mm-hmm. um, and you, you know, you you rig up the you rig up the keg properly and stuff like that. No. When I was in Glasgow, I was there. I was there the first week of January for a for a night, and um, when we parked up the car, we were we had our, the hotel I was staying. It was maybe like a mile away from the car park. But the idea was that we would kind of just pub crawl up to the up to our hotel. Yeah, and aye. It didn't work out that way because we had the first pub we went to was um, was like a kind of old manny horseshoe bar. Okay. Um, on a Argyle Street called the the Waterloo, it was just right. the first pub. So we went yeah. in there. Um, and it was tenants they had on tap, but it was such a clean bar, um, just really well kept. And the the, the paint, quality, the quality of this tenants was great. It was like, actually, there's no reason why we would pub crawl. We could just chill mm-hmm. here. It was, it was January, so it was freezing outside and that. And it was like, um, so I. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. uh, I. Uh, I've got nothing else to say about beer. <laughs> we have let the side down, and we've not got an Andrew and Crana to back it all up. Um, so where was in Glasgow? Are you going on Saturday? I, I've not got a clue. Uh, it's it's make it up as we go along. Like I'm, yeah. I've I've got the hotel, so I know where I need to be at three o'clock. Get checked yeah. in, and then um, find Tom. Then we're going to do the pub crawl that we should have did in December, and. Yeah, it's more or less like, oh, look, there's a bar. Let's go in. Let's yeah. get a drink. And then we usually take recommendations uh, off of people. There's like some Instagram guys we know in the area that's going to meet up with us and have a couple nice. of drinks. Uh, so I think we're going to be stopping at the Grunt and Growler, oh. which oh, is yeah. um, uh, like a bottle shop and a wee sit-in yeah, bar are, yeah. as well. But I think they're doing a, uh, a Burns night thing in the middle of the day where they're going to be doing a whiskey tasting and pairing it with beer at two o'clock oh. in the afternoon <laughs> it's like right we'll I go mean, after that yeah because like i'm not going to see past five o'clock yeah, if we're sweet, starting right. with whiskey and beer but no i'm just going to go there and just make up as we go along normally we take a recommendation and next thing i know tom's ordered an uber and we're off to the, ne- the other end of glasgow to have a couple more drinks 
So that's yeah, so that's pretty cool. Man. Mm-hmm. See, when I went there, it was um as we stayed in there, we went to we, we took an Uber up to onto Socky Hall Street and we bounced about a few bars there. But um yeah. It's great. What I like about Glasgow because it's just, particularly the city centre. You can go in and they de- always tend to have like quite a decent tap line in any bar. You know what I mean? You can mm. go in. And I went into um, we went to actually the when I was out there, I was looking for a pub court. I was looking for a pub quiz. Total mad for pub quizzes. But um, <laughs> googled it, found a pub that had a pub quiz. Went there. There wasn't a pub quiz on, but they had a tiny rebel on tap. So I was like, this will do. <laughs> so, um, Did actually, you see those a uh, tiny rebel? A uh, little boxes that's going around at the moment. Oh, and they're all the, taking yeah. the piss out of the energy drinks. It's a monster, Slimfast, uh, Prime, Prime, and the Huel. Yeah. Yeah, so then. Um, <laughs> I was like, that's I wa- pretty clever. I had a look, it's £16 for a pack of them, um, mm-hmm. which isn't too bad, actually. It works out at £4 a can plus post. It is £4 a can, and then yeah. plus postage. But, um, which is, it's tiny rebel, the round. But the, the other thing, the, I, they're just such a good brewery because they've already released it. With their, their birthday boxes always come out in about February time as well. I think their birthday ah, is in right. February. Okay. So they've they've got their they've got their birthday box out as well. But that's I did it for their eighth birthday, the one right. before lockdown. Okay. And um, it was really cool. The gimmick was that there was a there was how did it work actually? There was four beers in the box mm-hmm. that you could or no six beers in the box, but you could pair them. A certain way and you got another couple of beers so it basically made like you know you could grab two cans enjoy them separately but if you kept enough you could mix them oh, and you got you crazy. got you got that's third beer. alchemy nice. yeah exactly <laughs> um, i enjoyed that but that was like 40 you know that was 40 pound a box it was a different yeah. time oh, yeah, it's the same i've I seen a lot of people getting their uh christmas advent calendar mm-hmm. and like but it's still it, it's silly money for beer advent calendars because that's so you're paying for like 24 tins of craft beer Me. so you're always spending at least 50 to 60 quid yeah. like on a basic box at least yeah oh totally because i'm um, i've got a friend that did it, did it and like you pull it out and it's like some of it's like punk ipa you know like, that's a one pound 30 pound can you know it's a small yep. punk ipa can oh so, and it's like fair enough, but um, mm-hmm. you just do it with a box. You could do that yourself, like <laughs> yeah. I right, we're gonna do that this year because I got the the Edinburgh um beer box where it was just Edinburgh breweries all pitched in a few tins, yeah. and majority of them were the four forty ml cans, and it was a great mixture. I mean, I've got uh, I think it was Camper Van Brewing. Oh, they're a, they're they, a phenomenal, uh, yeah, a phenomenal they, brewery. Around. They've got like a double IPA that's like nine point four percent. Like in a blinking advent calendar, yeah. so it's like wow. I, I can't remember if that was like the the twenty fourth, like the, here's your Christmas present type of beer. But um, I decided. I mean, well, I fancy it. It's just just the money required to do it. Is well, good I, mate, I I was religiously put ten pound away each month. Oh, like I got a, a ten in January. And it gets to about September, October before they start advertising it. And by that time, I've got 70, 80 quid just it's to cover strange. my cost. It's not what I considered, man. Yeah. So, because I, I, I was. I thought, something, I thought something similar, but making my own box up and then just like um, getting somebody to blind buy me, you know, even go into a yeah. shop and buy me to or something. I, yeah. I, I have that plan myself. I mean, I, I'll go step off camera for one second because it's still lying here. Uh, for our radio listeners, Stuart's just popped off to grab something. What will it be? So, um, I wasn't ready to recycle my box just yet. And I love the idea of getting someone to do blind buys and make your own. So, I, I took the original box and just cut it in half. Oh, nice. So, it's just uh, 12. So, nice. yeah, uh, my wife. Is planning on uh, filling that full of beer for me for next Christmas. Oh, that's so, I, so and yeah, I just thought it takes up too much room. So yeah, let's just cut it down the middle. That leaves me with twelve beers, twelve nice wee surprises, and yeah, I'll probably still buy another calendar. But now I have two. Yeah, I had thought about buying it tonight. My, my, the beer count, the beer, the beer calendar box. That's a great idea. Um, Savingston. Mm-hmm. That's good. 
Right, uh, I'm just thinking shut up. I so, so um I didn't read any comics this week. I don't know if you did. I, I out... read one. Oh, I'm nice. all, I've I've yeah, I made it my goal last week. I so there it is. The Godzilla Rivals, oh, Ghidorah. Nice, I originally bought this for my son, who absolutely loves Godzilla, um, but has no interest in comics, so it's just sat on a shelf. Um, so, yeah, they were all playing Minecraft at the weekends, and I just went upstairs, took the book, and just sat and looked through it. And it, it's it's usual, where it's the mixture of, right, you've got like, the big kaiju fighting, and then you've got your human storyline going on as well. Uh, I'll try and find a the nice shots. There was one image that stood it really well because it's it's uh, Godzilla versus Hedora. So Hedora's just like this big it's the white monster. Hedora, isn't it? It's all the such monster is Hedora. Yeah. yeah. So I uh, know yeah, that that works pretty cool. There's yeah, it's good one you. cracking shot uh, of like the, the female lead character. And I swear, every time I picked up the book, I saw that page on accident. And now when I'm looking for it, ah, here we go. I mean... Oh, wow. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's pretty cool, man. So... That's interesting, because actually, I'd, I'd read a Godzilla Power Rangers crossover last year. Ah, amazing. There was some... It wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, but there was some yeah. really poor panel work, actually, in there. There was a couple ah. of... It's the only time where I've actually been like, wow, that's fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, I've never felt like that, and um, the artist is a very well respected artist. It's the guy who did um, whose name escapes me, but he he did the um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles versus Batman stuff, which is how he got. Oh know, which is, yeah, which is really well regarded. I just don't mm-hmm. know. It was just one panel in particular where I don't know what it was. It's maybe he hasn't seen that much Power Rangers, but he he had um, the Megazord moving right in a way that like a very like he had the Megazord in like a full sprint he pose, and I was like. <laughs> The Megazord doesn't run like that. Like it probably could, but mm-hmm. yeah, you, it would look shit if you <laughs> freeze framed it, you know. <laughs> Aye. Um. um, but no, it was a good. Uh, the the story, obviously, Godzilla versus Hedorah is like the story in the background. Yeah. But the main story kind of focuses on this young man trying to rush a doctor who supposedly is the head of the kaiju defense organization and she's yeah. been injured so he's rushing across town it, it's i think what was it like san francisco i uh, know new york 1971 yeah uh, the, this uh fight's taking place so it's just focusing on him trying to get her to like an overcrowded hospital uh just to kind of help but yeah. it's the usual it's kind of that's not the true story of what's going on and yeah, I feel like I've read better Godzilla comics. I remember getting um, Godzilla Goes to Hell from from uh, Kingdom Comics back in the day, and that was literally like there was no dialogue in that book ever. It was just like Godzilla uh, going through the different like like through Dante's Inferno, different rings, so sort of, like each issue, and <laughs> it was just cool. It was just just kind of just flipping through it, taking in the art, taking in. All, all this shit that gets flung in Godzilla's way, but um, suppose, there's only so much you can write when you're doing a Godzilla comic. I think, um, yeah, it, def- it definitely like I said, the, the Power Ranger on I read was like it was fine, but it went exactly as you expected it to. The um, Power Rangers crossed over from their Angel Grove to an alternative one where mm-hmm. they never existed. Godzilla's there, obviously, they assu- initially think Godzilla's a threat. Then there's a there's a I mean a subplot with Rita Repulsa and the aliens from the guys that are always trying to use King Ghidorah. Yeah, um, with, like the Planet X guys from they're like mm. it's a planet on I think that orbits Jupiter. And yeah. um so they're they're like trying to they're trying to manipulate monsters and then Rita quite likes that because that's always what she's trying to do. And then mm-hmm. it's just just different levels of escalation until the Power Rangers eventually realise that Godzilla isn't the threat, it's the other monsters and they have yeah. to work. They have to work together basically, and that's it. Yeah, no yeah, way. and that's it. Uh, this uh, Godzilla rival series, I've not looked into who else I know at the back of the issue, it's got uh, him and Mofra, yeah. Um, but I mean, it was it's like an eight dollar book, yeah. So, like, I bought it because I knew like my kid loves 
Godzilla, and I thought this is just like an easy uh, throw in with it, like his birthday presents. Um, but I know I would probably, if I could find, like, I would pay a fiver mm-hmm. if I could find those comics for a fiver. I mean, there, there's comic book shops in Glasgow, I might try and have yeah. a look, uh, just to kind of see what Godzilla stuff's kicking about. Um, but uh, other than that, I've uh, back out to work and I've gotten back into the swing of listening to the Sandman um, nice, audiobooks. Um, so there'd be some really interesting stories. Um, there's one where there's a, a man that's on the verge of committing suicide and uh, the Sandman decides to make a bet and comes up with, um, he just gives them like this title saying, right, as of tomorrow, you are now like the, the emperor of America. And then yeah. he just he's walking about the streets and Fokker saying, oh, like they're making fun of his appearance. And he says, well, no, that you can't talk to me like that. That you're my subjects. I'm the emperor of America. And by the time it's the end of his life, like he is pretty much become the emperor of America. Like the people in the street loved him. Uh, when he passed away, they somehow came up with a monument where they blocked out the sun for his funeral. Like this was just a guy that just had a Ponzi title, and by the end of it, he was a legend. Yeah. And uh, he was voiced. His voice was done by uh, Jonathan Lithgow, so it just added that that, oh, yeah. that great detail to it where you could hear him with like that great voice of like thirty rock for the sun, and like, he's yeah. always got that that great character voice. And yeah, it's it's strange because they go for that, and now it's like a story where. It's all focusing on like a character called Barbie, and she's broken up from Ken, and you're like, what? And yeah. it's like I feel like I need to look out the comics just to kind of see what the visuals are, because I'm just getting all of this the like, audio. It's just like a stage play, almost. The, the, the visuals are amazing, like of of the Sandman. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, Dave McKean very heavily involved, um, mm. former uh, podcast guest of the Burgunders. <laughs> um, his his um, that's like. That's funny because, like, you, trying to buy the Sandman now is, but you buy it as a, like omnibus and stuff like that. But actually, yeah. those individual issues, if there was any series that I reckon folk need to buy as an a, an individual set purely because of the art, mm-hmm. you know, it's those separate covers. There's like each each yeah. cover, each cover is to be framed. They're amazing. Um, just such a cracking series, Sandman. Neil Gaiman's mm-hmm. an absolute legend. So yeah. So yeah, I'm really enjoying that. I'm about halfway through it, and I've already. I bought the the third volume, so I think when I was looking at the where it counts in the comics, it's like issue thirty I'm at now. Yeah. So it's kind of like well, a good way to kind of get through them whilst just cutting about driving to work. Yeah, no, that's 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 really cool. Um, actually, I've 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 got this not Disney Plus. I've got I've got Disney Plus. I've got Amazon Prime though. And mm. uh, like some, I hadn't realized I was chatting to someone and they were like, Have a little look at what else you get for Amazon Prime because obviously I use it for the TV and the free delivery on stuff. But yeah. actually, like, you get Prime Comics as well or Prime Books. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, you don't get Prime Audios, but actually, I think you get like a you do get like a like a slightly reduced rate on Audible mm-hmm. because they're a because they're a Amazon yes. company. So Aye. I've always yeah, I do a lot of driving. I do. I've got a couple of podcasts I listen to, so I like. But I've always thought like I might go down the audiobook route because I don't read as much as I'd like to. So yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I do this. enjoy audiobooks because when trying to read actual books, I'll, I have such a short attention span, and then I realise I'm reading the start of the same paragraph for the third time. Yeah. Uh, whereas just audiobooks, again, like podcasts, you just put it on. And if you need to drive for 45 minutes, that's cool. You get through a couple of CDs a day and it's like, wait, I am technically reading. Like this is, I've, I've read like the young bucks all biography. I've read half a dozen, yeah. uh, James Patterson books. And, and they said, well, yeah. are you really reading it? I said, well, I know the story. I know what happens. So yeah, I am taking it in. So this is a bit I think we had on here before. Who did the Young Bucks? Who was it? The Young Bucks? Did they read their own? Old yes. Old- uh, no, they didn't. It was just a just a voiceover artist, but yeah. it was written like they had done like a chapter each type of thing. So yeah. so just as interesting. But the rules of fun novelty when it is uh, the author reading mm-hmm. it. I mean, uh, like good old Jr. done his two audio books. Yeah. 
So it's it's always good to hear it kind of from the author himself. Yeah, I'd, I'd quite like to listen to him. My favorite, my favorite all, wrestling autobiography. It's a bit of a slog. So we're wrestling fans. For anything, we'll, we'll come back to the comics in a second. But uh, I like Brent Hitman Hart say autobiography is amazing. I'd really like to hear him read it because he's so mm. fucking better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought up um, the same. I'm glad you're back to reading that as well. It's a fun cracking series. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that's uh, just when like getting through this, it's like, oh man, I wish like the TV show would catch up as quick as like I'm getting through them. I, there's only maybe 11 episodes on Netflix. Yeah. But uh, like if it's going to pick up from where it's left off, we've got a lot of great material coming up. It's, so, it's such a dense, it's a dense series. So yeah, um, I was always quite interested when they mentioned, when it, when it came up that um, Netflix were doing the Sandman because you, you know, you have your reservations, but it is, I mean, it is good. Um, it's mm -hmm. so dense. They're like, they've got 10 seasons worth of material easily. Yeah. Um, with Sandman, so I don't know if that's what they'll ever do. Uh, Talking about Netflix, uh, I am, um, um, I've my one of my favorite shows made a comeback today, kind of. So, yeah, All I'll right. be talking about that a wee while. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I watched the first couple of episodes. Um, but while we're still on comics, will I do my list thing that I've been. Yeah, yeah, about? you've been working on it. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm keen to hear. So, what we decided, um, because we've got a couple of folk who I was speaking to somebody um, who. <laughs> Sorry, my dog's friend, um, who oh, asked about our audio on our nice. YouTube because he um doesn't use Facebook. And was like, right. so actually, he was like, I like your content, but um, I like your content, but you don't, you you don't, well, well, I, like, I, it's because it's me that does it and I'm quite lazy and I'm also really bad at delegating. Um, are, uh, are, like, if you want to watch every episode that we've ever done, it's on Facebook, it's here, but um, mm. live. But if you, um, if you miss that, um, or if you don't use YouTube, or Facebook, you miss. And we have audio, but I'm I'm behind on that because it's time consuming. And YouTube is just the same because there's a it's a it's a relatively technical, but at, like it's a bit of an admin job, and it's quite exciting. yeah. Boring. But um, I've decided I've I've built into my week time to do it because there is people that okay. are out there, and as we've seen from like Neil Whaley's video, um, mm -hmm. there are people that want to access our stuff. One of the other things that somebody suggested to me, I put a thing up at the end of the month, at the end of December, saying, what would you like to see next year? Some people's like, I would quite like, he basically said he wanted us to thumbnail the episodes because like, he's like, sometimes I want to skip the beer bit, sometimes I want to skip the comic bit, sometimes I just Oh, yeah, it. you can put chapters in. Nice. Yeah, but that's also time comes to him. <laughs> so but one of the things I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start like editing out and just re-uploading interviews. But also, we, mm -hmm. we talked about doing lists. Um, because there's lots of folk, in, including me, who absolutely love the, the list aspect of a, of a show. And like, it's when I say a list aspect, some people are like, What I was speaking to a mate about it, he's like, What do you mean? And I was like, Just like picking a topic and writing something about it. Yeah. So uh, last week we decided to do the 10 best comic writers, in our opinion. But then I changed it because as I was trying to formulate the list, I was like, oh, I would like there to be more representation from like local and Scottish guys. And then obviously Andrew asked why. And I, like, oh. <laughs> and, and, and I kind of thought about it. I was like, well, actually, and then we had that conversation about like, like there are some of the greatest writers of all time, but you've also got writers that you, um, writers that you're enjoying presently and stuff. So I changed the list to just being 10 writers you should be checking out. And it gives us that opportunity to then turn around and go in the future, here's 10 more writers you should be checking out. Yeah. So, uh, uh, with that, so with that mind, I I did I offered to take up the first list. Um, so hold on, because there's a lot of shit happening in the background in my house right now. That's cool. <laughs> this yeah, is what happens so, when it's live. Yeah, totally. Uh, so yeah, my idea is that this, you know, the next ten minutes will be the next ten minutes of me chatting, and you, you know, fire in thoughts if you've got them. Um, cool. Yeah, but I am. Um, yeah, this is this bit's gonna get edited down into a video. So for anyone that just wants to go, what do the regulars want us to check out? They can. Um, so I wrote a script and tried to be a bit of a journal. Uh, so here we go, because this will this will be this will be done as audio as well. So um, yeah, to quote the great Andrew McGee, if you want to find comics you enjoy, you should find and follow a writer, because writers are a bit like movie directors with stylistic choices and thematic leanings that you would love to see in different properties and scenarios. 
Um, the former Dark Horse editor Amina Bennett once said that good comic book writers think in pictures as well as words. Which maybe didn't say that once. She maybe said it loads of times, but I only mm. ever heard her say it once. And uh, she may have said it more than a few times, but I don't follow her around because I'm a total geek. But um, she is right. Uh, the medium of comic book writing is super hard. There is no precise way to do it. And if you follow the comic book mediums as closely as we do, you start to learn that every writer puts their story together and generates those pictures together differently than everyone else. And that one can be quite fascinating. Uh, I would totally recommend, for example, David Cranor, our very own David Cranor. He has released scripts of his comic books, and they're quite fascinating wow. just to see um, as a comic book writer, as somebody that tries to do it himself from time to time, it's quite interesting seeing how other people write. Yeah, um, yeah. So the best comic writers out there are creating the foundations of art. Some of that art is genuinely life changing, and as I said earlier, it's really, really hard to do. Um, and trust me, as someone that sort of does it, um, the, this list is entirely subjective, and it isn't a top ten. It's simply ten fantastic storytellers that we, as a team, would recommend you checking out. They are uh, they're put in a random order so it isn't like though it's 10 it isn't a top 10 um, mm -hmm. and they are but a drop in the ocean of loveliness that we will all continue to swim in so let's get wet together <laughs> uh, we are the Brugaders and here are the top 10 comic writers you oh no here are just 10 comic writers you should check out so number 10 was John Wagner <laughs> John Wagner is a British comic writer an American born British comic writer who alongside Pat Mills helped revitalize British comics in the 1970s and he continues to be active in the comic book industry today, occasionally also working in American comics. Best known probably as a co-creator alongside artist Carlos Esquire as the as the creator of Judge Dredd. Uh -huh. um, in the 1980s, he was a co-writer. Him and co-writer Alan Grant wrote prolifically for IPC's 2000 AD, Battle, Eagle, Scream, and Royal of the Rovers. Um, they were also part of that phenomenal like squad of British writers that went over to America. Um, and start. I think the eighties British comic invasion would be what kind of what they called it. You know, you've got guys like oh. Dave Pugh, you've got guys like um, Alan Grant, uh, uh, Grant Morrison, Alan mm -hmm. Moore. Yeah, but they were just um, Pat Mills, obviously. Um, so he, um, so when um, John Magner went over, he wrote for the DC Comics Batman, he created a series of Batman and Judge Dredd team up comics, and he he also over here started the British independent comic, The Bogeyman which was eventually turned into a TV series starring Robbie Coltrane. Uh, and Judge Dredd has been twice adapted for film, as we all know, um, yep. with varying degrees of success. And also his graphic novel, A History of Violence, was adapted by um, visionary movie director David Cronenberg for um, the 2005 film of the same name, which had, yeah. a, had yeah, Aragorn. Vigo. Yeah, Big Vig. Aye. <laughs> So yeah, a, a absolutely amazing caliber writer. In 2016, um, he, he teamed up again with Alan Grant to create a new comic for BHP Comics, a British um, British comics um, organization, I think based in Glasgow, uh, drawn by Dan Cornwall, former guest of the Brugaders. It's called Rock of the Reds, and it tells the story of a dangerous intergalactic outlaw, Rock of Arcade, who, while on the run, hides on the planet Earth by taking over the body and life of a troubled football star, Kyle Dixon. It's fucking quality. Anyone hasn't read Rock of the Reds, it's basically Roy of the Rovers mixed with uh, sci-fi opera. It's just great. Yeah. Uh, an alien that hides in a human's body and eventually and that falls in love with football. <laughs> so, mental. Uh, it's mental, but very, very good. Um, mm -hmm. uh, described by Warren Ellis as the probably the single most influential comic book writer in British comics. Wagner is also named as an influence by writers such as Alan Grant, who says he taught him everything he knows about comic writing, and guys like Alan Moore as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That took me ages. That's number 10. <laughs> number, <laughs> nine, number nine was one of uh, your um, suggestions, was Scott oh. Snyder. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, do, do you have a blurb for that, or do you want me to I try? Do you, and... a blurb? do you want to say something first, or do you want me to read my blurb, and then you can tack um, on? Or... No, no, uh, definitely. I want to hear what you've got to say. So... Uh, Scott Snyder has written comics for both DC and Marvel, including best-selling series as American Vampire, Batman, mm -hmm. and Swamp Thing. He's one of the hardest um, writing writers in comics, I think. Must be. Um, even if you, if you go on his Wikipedia and just look at his credits, it's absolutely unreal. Like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stuff. Actually, mm -hmm. like if like you look at his Wikipedia and the alphabet uh, it puts all his writing credits in alphabetical order, and um, 
aye, it's just nuts. There's like 20 A's, 20 B's, 20 yeah. C's. It's, just, oh it's crazy. Um, I would say for me, like, I, I'm not as familiar with his writing. I, I know what he's done. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not a massive mainstream comic reader, um, but I did engage with his writing quite heavily in 2017 when he um, he shook the DC comic landscape to its very core with his Dark Knight's Metal series. All right, okay. Um, I say Dark Knight Metal series, I would call it a saga. Um, mm-hmm. He created a number of characters, including alongside Greg uh, Kupalu, the Batman who laughs. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, and Scott Snyder, you, 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 everyone just needs to go and check out the Batman who laughs. If you, if I, the, I think one of the main reasons we formed this list was to try and create a like jump on point for folk who are like we often yeah. get asked by folk, oh, who should I be reading? You know, what should you know? What what comic do you suggest? And um, mm-hmm. as I said about earlier, Andrew as a comic book shop owner has all, I've heard him say it multiple times. You don't need to be checking the comic book characters; you need to be checking the comic book writers. Because yes. actually, if you if you enjoy that writer, then you can. You, you can check out anything he's done. And if you enjoy Scott Snyder's stuff, mm-hmm. as I know you do, uh, as I do, yeah. you can you can, you can can just look at his catalog and go, oh, that'll be interesting. I like his writing, so I want to mm-hmm. see what he does with this guy. Um, and certainly, as I say, he created a Batman Who Laughs, who's going to be a big deal. I think he's already a big deal in comics, the Batman Who Laughs, but if you haven't checked him out yet, you should check him out now because he's going to be a big deal. He will be a, he will be a future baddie in a movie and you can be really smug about it when that happens you get so if you check him out now you can be like i know who the batman who laughs is (laughs) Um, yeah that that was my book (laughs) awesome um my introduction to him i think came with the the dc new 52 sort of reboot because i think that initially started off with scott uh writing for like writing the Batman comics, yeah, uh, with the, the Court of Owls. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he also started uh, with the the reboot of Swamp Thing in the new 52, maybe oh, yeah. as well as Animal Man, but then uh, eventually his main focus w- stayed on Batman and Swamp Thing and Animal Man were then taken with other writers. Um, but I, I just loved. I always love the visual and like the history of like Swamp Thing. So uh, Scott Snyder's take on it was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think one of the main Batman stories that stood out was the Black Mirror. Oh yeah. So that was one of. It was just like random paperbacks. I was uh, trade paperbacks. I was buying, and it's purely because it had Scott Snyder's name on it. Yeah. And the American Vampire thing, I'm glad you mentioned that because I remember borrowing that from the libraries. I think that was either like Scott Snyder and maybe Stephen King possibly oh, yeah. had credits on that or or it was like Stephen King's idea and Scott and that were kind of fleshing it out. That happens um, quite a lot in DC though, bringing guys to throw out ideas and then yeah. they'll get other writers to do it. Mm-hmm. So. So no, that's like well, whilst I do have a real limited knowledge when it comes to comic book writers, when I see names like Scott Snyder, uh, Warren Ellis, uh, Alan Moore, I'll tend to pay a little bit more attention to that than yeah. others. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Scott Snyder is like, has he? He um, he's just really influential as well. I've not got. A, I've not got. I think he's a that. really good guy on Twitter too. Yeah. Like, he, he always um, seems really fair. He, I think so. He's very rounded. He's also like, there's not very. I've always felt like this in comic writing anyway. But um, as a comic book creator, or as a like somebody that's just kind of getting into comic book writing and creation, there's no gatekeeping. There's mm-hmm. unlike many other hobbies or interests or sort of cultures. There's a or, or fandoms. There's a lot of gatekeeping. There's a lot of like, whereas that doesn't exist in comic book writing. And it's guys like Scott Snyder who really push that out as well. Apologize, <laughs> my dog's got a wee, a wee squeaky donut. So I know we um we um we interviewed a couple of guys last year. Um, who a guy Ben who is doing the Scott Snyder comic book class anthology, which basically um he um Scott did a comic book writers um comic book writers um, online classes last year. And a group of guys led by Ben just um, decided that they wanted to 
they wanted to put some sort of anthology together. Obviously, they, they, they networked through this writing group. And they, but Scott was happy for them to put their name on it as well. So they, they went to Scott and were like, met Scott Snyder and were saying, um, we've met through your writing classes and we'd like to do an anthology. Obviously, we would like to nod to the fact that it was your writing classes that brought us together. So could we call this the Scott Snyder Writing Class Anthology? And he was like, yeah. It's quite happy for them to do it. And um, it was a really successful Kickstarter. So um, anthology is going to be a bit hit on Kickstarter. And this was a really successful one. Obviously, the Scott Snyder name goes a long way, I think. so. Yeah, it's a good selling point. Yeah. And I don't think he asked for any money or that. He wasn't, like, asking for, like... He wasn't asking for a, a, a take of like profits yeah. or so like he just he was just like no nah, no nah, just take my name and go it's really mm-hmm. good um the next comic writer i don't believe is a is like that but he's a he's a visionary and i love him is a uh, alan moore you mentioned that when we were briefly oh, there yeah and, yeah um I, I put him on i put him deliberately put him quite early on in this list because he um everyone that knows who alan moore is um so my barbie is alan moore is one of the best comic writers ever i um According to the website that I got, um, I was using, and I but forgot the name of. He was DC's first British comic book writer, so obviously he was doing stuff in the UK, and DC brought him over because um, because he was that good. Um, Moore created fan favorite characters like um, fan favorite character books like Superman, uh, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, and he wrote um, the Killing Joke, which is also one of Batman's sort of um, deeper, more uh, like visceral character in, in investigations and explorations okay um this is for the audio listeners and the thing that um here's a wee game for you pause this grab a bit of paper and write down what you would consider to be the five most important comics ever done okay okay i bet you have at least one of the following three or the following four watchmen v for vendetta from hell the league of extraordinary gentlemen you should have at least one of them. He wrote all four of them. <laughs> uh, as I say, he wrote The Killing Joke, which is re- widely regarded as one of the best uh, Batman stories ever. And he had a run of Swamp Thing, which is heralded more than mm-hmm. 30 years later. It's, it's up there as one of the best runs of Swamp Thing ever. Um, I don't know many people who would lay claim to writing some of the most important comics ever, but he can. Uh, we all know where we were first. We all know where we first were when we discovered and started reading Watchmen. Just mm-hmm. like we all remember the bit at, immediately after discovering Watchmen when our mum told us to put down that really expensive book and get out of Waterstones. So, <laughs> uh, I remember yeah, that. Alan Moore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. One of my favourite things is about Alan Moore is he hates everything that's ever been produced that uh, based on his work. Yeah, I have heard that. Um, he disowns everything. If it's got his name on it, he disowns it. <laughs> whilst... I don't collect uh, comic books. I do like reading them. I, I remember when, kind of, right, I'm coming on the Brew Gooders now. I've got to get back in the habit of reading comics. And I just remember going to Andrew's shop and giving him half of my collection to trade in because mm-hmm. it's like, how did they read them? But out of that, I did keep all of my Alan Moore Swamp Thing books. Yeah. Because they're, they're special. They're, it's, you've not read anything like that before. And I've only read half of the run, so it's like, I kind of get rid of it. I need to kind of get back into it, read the rest. I've got maybe the first four books, and it might be six or seven that it goes on to. Yeah, I think, c- correct me if I'm wrong with the Swamp Thing run, I don't know that much about it, other than my understanding is he was just kind of a by-the-numbers character Swamp Thing. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, he had the tragic backstory, and the, but it's Alan Moore's kind of direction that has defined the series going forward and um one of the things i found when i was compiling this list is how influential the um the comic writers we're looking at have had on other media like films and television and every, yeah. every um but my other um my understanding of alan moore's swamp thing is it is the basis of the tv series that came out for dc all right yeah i, I never touched it Purely because I I remember hearing it was getting cancelled. It was yeah. something like a really expensive set to run, and as soon as I hear something's cancelled, I would feel like I can't yeah, put my, point no point in putting time into it. Yeah, it's really tragic because I bet that would be a bloody brilliant show. Yeah, and just in terms of there's so many shows like that, but yeah, that's certainly one of them. But yeah, even them like um, it's Alan, it's Neil Bailey, that from Hell is one of his favourite 
um, books alongside V for Vendetta. Mm. I would put V for Vendetta in one one of my favourite films as well. Like I, the book's great, mm. um, the, the the film's incredibly different, but like totally like removes the political aspects of many of the characters and makes it more of like a um, conservative Britain versus central left, <laughs> central left Labour Britain. Um, it totally like. It totally plays around with the politics and stuff, which are yeah. quite radical in the book. But oh no, V for Vendetta is one of the best. Um, it's, it's never been one of. I've I've not read the book. I've watched the film, but I take in it just never grabbed me. The, the best, really the, the best bits of the film are. It's a funny one. The best bits of the film are the bits that are lifted straight from the comic. Right. Um, some of the, in my opinion, some of them, some of the bits that are more challenging, are. Are bits that they've they've converted because obviously mm. they were they were trying to sell a Hollywood movie. Aye. Um, obviously, and I know the production was quite a. Uh, the production was kind of troubled as well because obviously there was um, there was that horrific bombing in London. I think the oh, week right. the week before V for Vendetta was due to get right. released. Oh yeah, so that's, you, that's... you can't you can't release a movie that's hero that's... bombs London. <laughs> yeah, that's troublesome. Yeah, that's unfortunate. So, I the only thing I remember that movie is like the kick fuck out with Stephen Fry. Yeah, they do kick fuck out with Stephen Fry. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I quite like Stephen Fry, so I was kind of glad. Yeah, it is. And he does a lot of voices in Sandman, so it's been great hearing him. But yeah, yeah my only memory of V from Van Vendetta is him getting his toys. Yeah, gets his toys. Going. Um, but no, Alan Moore's stuff's amazing. Um, I do like Watchmen's, Watchmen's Untouchable. I really like the Watchmen movie. Again, um, very, very, it's 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 really close to the book until obviously there's a couple of very key, strong key differences, but um, thematically and the vibe is very similar. The TV series for oh, I love the TV series. Um, sequel to the comic, the way um, yeah, aye. Just kind of quite. Um, I think Alan Moore's legacy it, it can't really be refuted. One of my favourite stories ever was um, um when, from a guest we had Dave Pugh on, who is was the artist in Slain. Um, in the eighties, among a lot, among, um, among many other things, and he was telling me and calling a story about how he was along, he was sat alongside Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore at, um, at a comic convention, and he heard like, they were kind of whispering, and he was like, he, they were whispering about their new series, but um, they weren't really telling anybody what they were working on, and apparently Gibbons turned around and and said, um, "Oh, we're doing this." Uh, we're going to be doing this Guy Fox thing after, but he's he's currently working on a thing where um no sorry it was David Lloyd was David Lloyd was there and he's saying I'm doing a I'm doing this um I'm doing this Guy Fox thing for him once he gets his head around this nine panel book he's going to be doing with Dave Gibbons and uh, and um I did Pew apparently turned around and went what do you mean nine panels he was like oh the whole the whole book's going to just be like three three boxes, a three by three box in each, you know, with nine panels in each page. And Pew, who's like quite an influential British comic writer from that time, was like, it's a fucking stupid idea. And obviously that, that, that nine panel page becomes like, that nine panel page book becomes uh, one of the most influential comics ever made. So, yeah. <laughs> in Watchmen, so fair enough. I um, also thought it was, uh, uh, aye. And that's, um, Neil Cena agrees about the film talking about Peter and Dare. I hope you're talking. I know Neil's a politician. I wonder if he's think, talking about the political aspect of that. <laughs> um, number seven, Warren Ellis, who. Um, so Warren Ellis has done a bit of everything. His first mainstream big break came with Marvel when he was writing Hellstrom. But soon after that, he was heavily involved with public, the publisher's 2099 imprint, which obviously I think everybody, if anybody doesn't know what that is yet, they're going to be like, wait, just wait till the new. Um, Spider-Man film. <laughs> he took over Excalibur after that. This is still remembered for positive changes in directions. Um, he's transitioned through DC and through to Image, becoming the man known for putting his unique signature on lines. He, uh, Warren Ellis's whole vibe was that it seems to have been that he came in and took troubled lines and made them better. You know, he revitalizes, he, he re revitalized old comics or tired characters and made them um, essential again. Um, mm -hmm. He's best known for the co-creator of several original comic series lines as well, including Dave Crana's favourite comic, Transmetropolitan. Um, he did Global Frequency. For, um, he did Red, which obviously became a phenomenal uh, 
set of movies in Red and Red 2. Um, who was in them? Was that Bruce Willis that was in the new ones? In yeah, Morgan? Bruce Willis, Mary Louise Parker, John Malkovich. Uh, Morgan Freeman in them, or have I made that up? Yeah, I know Morgan Freeman. Yeah, yeah then I think they threw in like Helen Mirren in the sequel, as you yeah, do. As you do. Um, he's a prophet comic writer. He's written several Marvel series, including Astonishing X-Men, Thunderbolts, Moon Knight. He wrote the extremist, the extremist story arc for Iron Man, which was the basis of Iron Man 3, the movie. Hmm. Um, uh, outside of comics, he uh, he's written works for television and video game platforms and was a producer and main writer on Netflix's Castlevania anime series. Ah, so, uh, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I just... Um, hmm. I was really hoping we were going to have a... I'm not as familiar. I've read Extremis. I've seen Extremis. Uh, I've seen, obviously, I've seen Iron Man, I've seen Iron Man 3. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've also... I've, uh, there was also an Extremis um, movie that came out, like a, an animated movie. I think Marvel played around with... I, I don't, if somebody like, corrects me if I've got this wrong, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, Marvel did a, a series, I think before the MCU probably picked off. They just released movies, but they were like comic movies. So... They were like they weren't supremely well animated. It was always just kind of, mm. it was kind of like one panel stuff that was kind of moving and drifting about. All right. Supposed to I think it was supposed to be like evocative of like a live action comic book rather than a movie in its own medium. I remember All watching right. I remember watching a couple of them and one of them was Extremist from Iron Man 3. So and, uh, and uh, extreme the extremist Iron Man story. Mm-hmm. Also for one, like folk need to tell me if I'm wrong about this. I don't know where this came from. This is totally just caught my mind. There was one that was like, is it Red Sun, which was the um the oh that was Superman one. The alternative yeah. world set. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. There was loads of these things. But yeah, I do mm-hmm. certainly remember discovering more Warren Ellis through the extremist one. And obviously I was hoping to get Dave Cranot on because he is a massive fan of Trends Metropolitan. That's a uh, that's like his favorite. I've movie. I've heard of it. I've I've never never read it myself, but I was a big fan of his uh, Moon Knight run. Yeah. Clearly my dog isn't, but... Oh, okay, I apologise. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, the, but his Moon Knight run, it was brilliant. Each issue, it was, there, it was stylish. It would play with the fourth wall. There, you would, there was one issue where it, it would just played around with like nine panels. Um, it would be maybe like one panel to begin with, and then the next panel is almost like it was looking at a building. You're looking into the windows of the building, and by the end of it, it's like midnight going through each panel, trying to yeah. escape these people, and it was just stuff like oh, you never imagined what you could do with a comic, and it really got me interested in the midnight character. And when Marvel were going to announce a miniseries, like oh, I hope it follows. Uh, the like the Warren Ellis run because it was just like it was kind of like Sherlock Holmes one issue, then he lost his mind the next issue, and then it was all the different stages of Moon Knight, where he is kind of like the White Knight, Superman, uh, uh, Batman style superhero, and then the other ones he's just he looks like Robert Downey Jr. from the Sherlock Holmes movies, and yeah, but. It was brilliant, and I did follow him for a while with what other books came after it, but I can't remember the series. I feel it was it Karnak or something. It was like yeah. another hero that I wasn't aware of, but Warren Ellis was writing it, so I decided, is it right? I'll follow it. Let's see where it goes from here. And he has. He's, obviously, he's done a lot more. I've only went as far as maybe following two series with him, but now I kind of actively search, like, like library catalogs, just to see if they have any Warren Ellis kicking about. That speaks for it. So that's what yeah, that's that's it. the whole point of this list is just that aspect is finding some of there. Um, one of my personal favorite writers is uh, Kieran Gillen. Um, hmm. But he's um, and he's our next list, and it, he's a British comic book writer and former video game and music journalist. Mm-hmm. He's probably best known for Phonogram and uh, Phonogram, sorry, and The Wicked and the Divine. But he's got loads of stuff that um, I discovered him. He did a run for Marvel as Journey into Mystery, which I really enjoyed. Um, but he's, um, he's got work with Image, obviously, Wick and Divine. He co-created alongside Jamie uh, McKelvey, which is, I say, on on, on Image. Um, he did Marvel stuff, Journey into Mystery. He did Uncanny X-Men. He did Young Avengers. Eternals. I think his Eternals run is a basis for the movie. Straight away uh-huh. down the road. 
and he it might be I, my, my opinion is it is or my understands it is but i'm, I'm mm -hmm. wrong, like you can totally kill me in the comics uh and he did um uh, he did a darth vader run where he co created as part of that darth vader run, he created the co-created the character dr afra uh, i was hoping that Al andrew was uh, here to or call was here <laughs> to know what that was but mm -hmm. um certainly seems to be i think Again, I'm not sure if uh, Doctor Afro is like a character that he maybe created in the comics and then it translated somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But uh, and yeah, at the time of this video's recording, he's 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 got a story. He, he's doing the first part of the new Marvel event, which is called The Sins of Sinister. Um, All right. Um, which I think is like Mister Sinister changes reality, and this series follows what that looks like ten, a hundred, and a thousand years. Mm -hmm. What that reality would look like. Um, he's he, he's writing a story. He's writing a, a story or a, a mini series within this event called A Moral X Men, which um, it is out this month. So right. yeah, if you want to, if you, uh, I thought that's quite cool. Marvel, these Marvel events are quite cool. Event, they're expensive, but a, a good a uh, um, a good comic event will is a good jump on point. If you're like again, if you're like what co what comic should I be reading? Well, pick a writer. Check this guy, Kieran, Kieran Gillen. Um, mm -hmm. And again, like these sort of series, like Wicked and Divine, you can, uh, Wicked and the Divine, you can start with that. And if you enjoy it, you're like, well, actually, he's done X Men. So check that out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you know yeah. different characters, it's this writer doing them. Um, and that kind of brings me on to the next guy, Ram V. Um, we, uh, okay. I, I laugh when Andrew put this name down because we've met Ram. He's a really, really good guy. Um, Abby, he's a phenomenally gifted comic writer. I've got, um, I've got two of his books. And they're two of my favorite comics, and I'm not. I'm actually unsure why I don't own any of his other stuff. Right. Um, but, um, so Ram V is an Eisner-nominated, award-winning author and creator of graphic comics and novels such as Gravity's Wall, The Savage Shores, which is phenomenal, uh, The Many Deaths of Layla Starr, and the Eisner-winning Blue and Green. Like, if anybody, like, I forget about Blue and Green because it Colin lent it to me. I read it, I loved it, and I gave it back. And then mm -hmm. I've, met, I've, I've been to Harrogate, um, Thought Bubble twice, and Ram's been there, and I've gone, I've been meaning to buy Blue and Green both times and just haven't. Um, stunning book. I, I say Eisner winning. Um, he's been publishing books, he's only been publishing books since 2016, but he's worked on to garner critical and popular success, including winning multiple awards. Apart from creating his original work, which is great, uh, he's also written for iconic characters and titles such as Swamp Thing, Justice League Dark, Catwoman, Venom. He's currently the Venom slash Carnage writer for Marvel. Ah. Um, and uh, I've also stood behind him in a queue in for, for pints <laughs> and Hangate. But he's so handsome, man. He's so handsome that uh, I avoided eye contact and didn't say hi. <laughs> um, That's it. Your life would not be the same again if you did make eye contact. Oh, well, I was, I was stood behind him and... James Tynion, who isn't on this list because he's going to be on the, the next 10 writers you should be checking out list. But James Tynion uh, was also standing there. And I remember being like, oh my God, James Tynion and Ram V are like messaging folk like, oh my God, like two of the best comic writers in the world are currently standing right in front of me. And then, and then I looked up and James Tynion had turned around the queues in the Harrogate pub that we're in and the Majestic were really long. He turned around and looked right at me and I was like, oh no. I'm gonna to have to engage in a conversation. He just looked at me, and went, "Fucking cues, man!" <laughs> so, and then turned around. I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, nah, "Everyone should be checking out Ravi stuff." As I say, if um, I read these Savage Shores and Blue and Green, both incredible books, and you should check them out. But um, I'm annoyed that I haven't read Gravity's Wall or the many the deaths of Leila Star. So they're they're on my list, um, and I think it should be on everyone's else. He also mm -hmm. like he also has written. Um, he wrote a short story in an anthology for Marvel where he, it was like a it was a, Wolver, a small Wolverine story and it was like six pages. Yeah. And it was really, really good. I enjoyed that too. So yeah. he's just, he's, he's adept at writing like long and shorthand comics, you know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so everyone should be checking out Ravi. Um, number four, I put Brian, uh, Brian K. Vaughan. Um, ah. So Saga's great. Everyone should read Saga if you've not read it yet. I don't know anything more to say about Saga that's not already been said. Um, Why the Last Man is superb. Um, 
I don't, I don't understand why that was so poorly received on Disney Plus. I can't, the, 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 the season. Oh, the series, yeah, that, that yeah. It, they got cancelled after one, wasn't it? Yeah, that exactly that exactly what you were saying earlier about that. Like, and actually, I love the comic. Like, it's mm-hmm. incredible. And but even I didn't check out the. I watched a couple episodes of the TV program and enjoyed it. But then I think it was one of those weird ones where it got released, and then after a couple of weeks they cancelled the second series. And it yeah. was like I don't know, I don't know why it wasn't so well received, but I just remember being like, "How is this not the like?" When I, re- I remember reading the comic, and then finding out they were going to do t- a TV series, a TV series of it through Disney Plus, mm-hmm. and I was like, "This is great!" Because actually, before he was re- before and then during the time he's been writing comics, um, Brian von Brian K von sorry wrote for Lost. He wrote for the TV ah. and, and Why the Last Man is, is is superb. It could be event television all up there with Lost, The Walking Dead, that kind of stuff. I generally think it's of that cal- the, the comic is of that caliber. Yeah. How they, how they fucked up that TV series when they had the comic writer as a TV writer. You know, he could have I helped. Know, you know, it's just a, such a weird one. Yeah, that's it. It's, it hurts. I mean, even that show Andrew recommended to us was it like. 1899 or 1849 yeah. and that that's cancelled now as well so as Is soon as right? it's cancelled it's it's like it kills my enthusiasm yeah. to watch it so because K- K- Cowboy Bebop, I was the same I, oh I yeah the... i i was genuinely gonna check that out because i thought this might be a good jumping on point and i could work my way back and then they kind of just canned it but yeah. that did look like an expensive show yeah i don't know what the, i don't know what the market success is but certainly so obviously, um, my last man got cancelled by Disney Plus. Paper Girls is on Amazon. Ah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. There's a paper, the Paper Girls comic series. I've read some of it. It will make you cry, and it will make you like punch the air and joy. It's, it's great. It's a nice wee series. And I've not read it, but Runaways is many people's favourite f- form of any media. All written by Brian I've K. Heard that too. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I've not read Runaways. I've read Saga. I've read the first graphic novel for Saga, and it is good. Really mm. good, um, but fo- focal. I think again, if you go like what we're saying about Alan Moore and what we're saying about other writers, like, w- like I've read Why the Last Man, and for I read Why the Last Man about ten years ago before I really got into comics. A friend lent it to me, and um, I remember loving it. And be, it, for for years, it was my favorite comic until I actually just started to discovering other comics. If if you'd asked me five years ago, or six, seven years ago, when I wasn't reading comics properly. Jeff, what's your favorite comic? I would always just say Why the Last Man. <laughs> so, um, but then my um Brian Vaughn's um catalogue is like that. Like folk will tell you Saga's their favorite comic. You will meet folk that will tell you Paper Girls is the best thing ever written. And then obviously run runaways, like some folk like are so passionately in love with runaways as a series that um this guy's an idea factory. Like I think yeah. I won't say that one more, like when when you can when you've got different books that different people say is their favorite story, like mm-hmm. lots in 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 mass, you've you're clearly doing something right. So yeah, I would recommend. I I personally would recommend My Last Man, but like I think Paper Girls is a lot of people's first like. I know lots of people that will turn around and say, "Check out Paper Girls. It's a great gateway comic. It's like a good like if you don't know where to start with comics, read Paper Girls." So that's a that's Jonathan saying he's read the first two volumes of. Um, I'm assuming Saga. It's brilliant. If it's not Saga, you're talking about Jonathan. Please let us know. But yeah, is um, Saga the game? Uh, sorry, the series that got turned into like a Telltale game for the Xbox. I wasn't uh, aware of that. Wolf, Let me double check. Is one of the characters like a? Oh god, it's something. I felt like it was of Wolf and Man. The video game was called. Yeah, yeah I think so. Well, there is a, there is a character in. in that I see. Saga creator talks potential games adaptions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. It must have happened. Uh... Oh, so Saga the comic? Uh, no, I don't know. It's definitely. I'm, I'm looking at. I'm looking at. I'm looking online. No, I think it might be. Is, is it Fables? Yeah. Is that another series? Uh, yeah, maybe I'm. But te- it certainly seems to be that like Telltale were talking about doing a, a Saga game. So hmm. yeah, I'm just. Uh, I've, I've yeah. I I read I played the Walking Dead Telltale game and was like, oh, I don't that, know that bloody heartbreaking. Yeah, it's like, like this is not what computer games are supposed to be. I don't choose between the child or the parent, which will die, and we're, you're on a timer. I'm like, what? No, I've got to save Ducky. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hold on, I've lost my list because I'm skipping between windows. Hold on. Oh my goodness. This is stressful. Shh. Give me that squeaky donut, you wee bastard. Come here. <laughs> Great radio. Uh, I'm, I'm puncturing all his toys. Come here. Oh my goodness. Hold on. I've got it. It's mine now. It's my donut. Not yours. <laughs> Those are quiet. I'm gonna have to stand here to hold this up to keep my dog quiet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I am. Um, I am asking my computer to do too much. Talk nonsense for two <laughs> seconds. That's fine. Um, I've got, sorry, I'm, holding I'm this up. You're back. All good. Right. <laughs> oh, it was, it was you good. asking me if it was a Telltale series. No. Oh yeah. Sorry, I sent you down a rabbit right. hole. I'm back. I'm just. Cool. There you go. The the just like, I don't have it now. Go again, away. like um, goodbye, Charlie Dog. Again, it's just in our creator, and our creator has contributed to different media, you know, um, or, or has yeah. created something that's been adapted into different stuff. It's, it's, and I think that that was something that I, as I was compiling a list, I said earlier, that was like, oh my goodness, like the amount of folk that like the amount of stuff that these guys have created that this, but like they've made a comic and it's the story's been regarded as strong enough that they're like. Yeah, well, it's like it's, it's been translated to other medium because they've been that impressed. So mm-hmm. um, I say, but I, I wouldn't be surprised with the, uh, I would I wouldn't be surprised with the uh, Brian Kevon stuff because uh, yeah, he he did write for telly, so he's probably certainly with Why the Last Man. There's there's a there's a cinematic aspect to that comic book series, which probably translated quite easily to the TV when they were trying to convert it into TV show. Nice. Um, number three, I put Mark Wade down. Um, that was um. I think Andrew mentioned Mark Wade, but then so did uh, John Bruce in our comments. Um, right. So yeah, is it, Mark Wade, is there anything he can't do? He did Doom Patrol, uh, Legion of Superheroes, Wonder Woman, and, and obviously ba- he did. He wrote Batman Gotham by Gaslight. He did an eight-year run in The Flash. Oh, yeah. He wrote he wrote something called Kingdom Come, which I believe is many people's favourite DC comic ever. Yeah, uh, it's usually like that. Like to talk things. about that. What is it? Uh, um, he was editor in chief of Boom Studios, where he eventually was pro- promoted to chief officer, and then he <laughs> moved from there to Marvel, where he did projects including Spider Man, Doctor Strange, Shield, Captain America, Fantastic Four, and a run on Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Um, and now he's currently uh, has a residency with the Vatican, writing the New Bible. Uh, I made that last one up, but you're not that surprised. <laughs> um, <laughs> now he's um yeah. Um, I read. Oh, just wait until it's adapted to a Netflix series, then I'll watch it. <laughs> um, I read the Doom Patrol book, um, the, the first set of graphic novels. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but um, if he has, if he was responsible for the initial run of Doom Patrol, it is great. And Grant Morrison was involved in that as well, actually. But yeah. that, um, that certain first, uh, that those, that first ten years of Doom Patrol, when it was effectively them taking shit characters or like. Like un- unloved characters and turning them into something else mm-hmm. is great. And um, yeah, Doom Patrol is another one of those series where I'm like, I love, I love the Doom Patrol series. Yeah, I, I've I've always been meaning to kind of have a look at it because they've got their own version of Cyborg as well, haven't they? Yeah. Well, it was um, they're in the uh, it's set in the same universe as DC Titans. You know the the Titans. Oh, program. the live action Titans. Yeah, they're they're in the same world as that. I, I think okay. maybe Swamp Things are maybe in that Swamp Things ah, in that sort okay. of we- weird PG thirteen DC universe. It's not the CW yeah. one. Okay, aye, because then you kind of had Constantine floating about there as well. Yeah, he was like an Amazon series that got cancelled, but he would appear in the CW shows and or the, animated. The, the, series. They all they all exist within the DC. So there was an episode of is it Crisis on Infinite Earths that the, the DC did like the event a couple of years ago where it was like a it was like on you know it was five episodes and so you had to watch the Flash on Monday and Arrow oh, on Tuesday yeah because it all lines up it all lines up and they're all they're all parts of the same series um and but, but there was a bit and I watched the whole thing even though I hadn't been watching them for years but there was um there was one episode where it showed you it just basically did like a a nod to all the DC universes, and there was a universe called um, um, there was a universe called you know they're all numbered, right. so like Universe Fifty, yeah. um, what it was called. There was um, 
um, Universe 66 was the one that had a, it's, it's there for like, Universe 66 is there for like 20 seconds. And it's a uh, Burt Ward, who's now in his like, oh, late 50s, walking walk, walk this chihuahua. Mm -hmm. And then the sky turns black and he just looks up and it uh, turns red, sorry, and he goes, holy crimson skies. And then that's all you get. <laughs> and there's, um, that's you, all you need. Yeah, and there's like Universe 99, Universe 89, which I think has got the, this guy that played Bullock in the, in the original 1989, the Tim Burton movie. Right. He's there, he's there for a bit and like, oh my God, we need Batman and just all mm -hmm. these different universes. But there is a universe in there where the Titans and Swamp Thing are there for a second. All like, right, like, okay. Recognising that there is other DC, there's other studios putting DC stuff out there is pretty cool. Yeah, ah, um, that's cool. But I think um, I think a lot of the Doom Patrol stuff in particular was very inspired by Mark Wade stuff. Just writes, every, just seems to have got involved in everything. Um, mm -hmm. Kingdom Come, uh, Kingdom Come, and Gotham by Gaslight are not too big. Just not massively into the DC stuff, really. To be honest, yeah. But um, I know we've had I know John Bruce and I know Andrew have talked about Kingdom Come in the past as being like the DC book. So um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, and we're down to the final two, um, in no particular order. Um, number, I'll go with number two, Neil Gaiman. <laughs> so obviously we, we we talk about him weekly without anyone really realising that's what we're talking about. So yeah. <laughs> you love Neil Gaiman. Everyone loves Neil Gaiman. Did you like that? Yes. Did you like that film Coraline? That was Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. uh, based on a book by Neil Gaiman. Did you like the Graveyard Book? It was him as well. He wrote the Graveyard Book. Stardust. Did you like, did you like Stardust? That was the next one on the list. Did you like Stardust? <laughs> He wrote the book. Did you like American Gods? He wrote the book. Yeah. Um, that episode of Doctor Who where the TARDIS becomes a lady from uh, that becomes that lady from that TV series Doctor Foster. He wrote that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. His comic series The Sandman and its spin-offs have won twenty six Eisner awards. It's one of the Jesus. best comics. It's one of the best comics ever. If you're a fan of The Cure and you haven't read it while listening to Disintegration and Drinking Rioja, then you can fuck off. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, nah, he's read he's read everything for everywhere. Do yourself Aye. a favor, watch Sandman, then check out the comic, then spend the next ten years reading Gaiman's works and giving it and um, giving into that gothic part of your soul. Mm -hmm. Just an absolute legend, uh, absolute legend. Like you're saying all his, stuff, his stuff's adapted. His stuff's have been adapted everywhere. There's films based on his work. There's TV series based on his work. He's um he's written he's written books that then Dave McKean drew and then this, and then Dave McKean directed the film. So is it, have you ever seen the film or heard of the film Mirror Mask? Uh, no. Pretty cool. I, I watched it. I watched it when I was in uni. And then when I was researching, I watched it at like a uni event and like 20 people in a cinema in Stirling. And then I remember um, doing my revision for interviewing Dave McKean. And then I was like, oh, Mirror Mask was a Neil, Neil Gate. Uh, like Mirror Mask was directed by Dave McKean. That's cool. Mm -hmm. and just looked at that. I was like, "Oh, so Dave McKean directed that movie?" I went, I, went, I saw it many uni. So I'm, you know, I just thought he was a comic artist, and I was like, "Oh, Mirror Mask is a book written by Neil Gaiman." <laughs> that <laughs> so um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, you guys are total legend. Um, mm -hmm. Please check out. Well, we're saying, as I mentioned, Dave McKean. Check out his frequent collaborator, Dave McKean, is a really good guy as well. And you should check out. He's drawn some. He he'll probably be in our artist list that we do soon, but. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what else we to say about Neil Gaiman that we haven't said already. Like you've, I know. you've um, if you have the chance to listen to his audiobooks because he narrates all of them, mm -hmm. um, and it's just brilliant just to listen to him tell you stories. Just as it's, it's something else that's really, I, I'd love it if he would just narrate like all books. I love him <laughs> just to tell me all the stories. So when, you, when you click on like when you click on, when you click on audio options, you've got like English, French, Neil Gaiman. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> oh, Neil Gaiman's narrated Fifty Shades of Grey. I go on then. <laughs> no, he's um, he, he is some guy as a Stardust is great. Like yeah, yeah. I like I, I don't know how accurate this is, but if you just kind of like, do you think about like where these ideas started and when they're created and then what mm. they spun off? So like. Without star, without him writing Stardust, you wouldn't have that really awesome song by Take That, like <laughs> you know, that like, you and me we can ride on the sky. Uh, okay, that I was, know. Yeah. That was that connection. I was going to say I thought you were going to say we wouldn't be introduced to Charlie Cox, but 
Um, well, and, and Charlie Cox, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Everyone's daredevil, yeah. Exactly. Everyone... Oh, exactly. Good point, man. Yeah. yeah, and just just things like that. Um, that episode, of Do- I'm a massive Doctor Who fan. That episode of Doctor Who that he wrote was a total right. event for me because it was like my favorite book and comic writer uh, of the time writing my one my TV my favorite TV show. And it was a it was a it was a it was a banger, like a total banger. Um, and then the cast, uh, the cast of girl from Doctor Foster, whose name escapes me. She was also in um she's in uh, Smith and Bailey as well, like that. Uh, just some loads of other stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, she's a really good, she's a really quirky person to be playing. She effectively like uh, Michael Sheen or the voice of Michael Sheen was yeah. like a was a, was an AI that took over the TARDIS by pushing the consciousness of the TARDIS out, and it, the TARDIS managed to, the TARDIS managed to find itself in the body of this woman. So she's like effectively the soul of the TARDIS trapped in a woman's body and it's just really, really smart. And I was like, Neil Gaiman, this is brilliant. <laughs> you've, re- you've written a, v- a cracking piece of Doctor Who here. <laughs> uh, he's, he's also just written Doctor Who novels as well. Yeah. Like he's, he's, he's such a prolific writer. That leaves yeah. us to number one. Don't don't be raging. I'm sorry I didn't include your favourite writers, but that's why we changed it to just 10 writers you should check out because um, um they are great writers and there's so many more to go and we'll probably do this mm. list over and over again. Um, probably work out a way to cut it down to less than 40 minutes because this is supposed to be a 10 minute portion of a video on YouTube but uh, oh well oh well um, no, so for the last writer I wanted to talk about number one is John Lees okay so uh, here's a conversation that happened five years ago hey Jeff hi Colin read this comic what is it the best Scottish comic book ever written yeah okay whatever Colin John Lee <laughs> is a comic book writer based in Glasgow, Scotland. His work sync, his works include Sync, which is the best Scottish comic book ever written. Um, John's first published comic, The Standard, launched worldwide in January 2013. Um, he then did a breakout comic in 2014 called And Then Emily Was Gone. Um, every year since then, he's brought out something else. He's um, He brought out... Uh, Oxymoron, The Loveliest Nightmare in 2015. He brought out Quilt, which was a one-shot for 2016's Halloween Fest. Um, he did. Uh, he wrote for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Universe in 2017. And then, also in 2017, he released the Glasgow-based crime thriller, Sync, uh, which, launched, which launched the comics uh, comic shops worldwide in September 2017, was uh, John's most successful comic, and is one of the most outstanding comics ever. It's so, so good. We talk about it almost weekly on the podcast, if not twice weekly. Um, John's a really good guy. We we will tell anybody that is trying to get into comics, but what is looking for something different to check out Sync. Um, there's been conversations about your favorite, co- I've been in conversations about your favorite comic panel ever. In a comic, and I've been able to turn around and say the end of issue seven of Sync. I think it's issue seven of Sync. The last panel of that comic is my favorite panel in any comic. It's the one time I've read a comic and actually woke my wife up because I've been so excited by what I've read that I've went, "Oh fuck!" And then my wife's going, "What?" And I'm like, "Oh, just this comic I've read." <laughs> it's, like, um, it's about a fictional suburb of Glasgow, Sync, a fictional suburb of Glasgow, which is a an amalgamation of all the um, horrible um, urban legends that mums in Glasgow used to tell their kids to keep them safe, like be back before dinner, otherwise the clown ice cream van will come and get you um, and that kind of stuff. So um, John's a really good guy. Um, We've had him on the podcast a couple of times. We've been, we've hung out with him at Comic Cons. He has noted in the past that, Folk keep coming over and saying, I've been told to check out your book. And he's like, Was it the Brugers that sent you? And he's like, Yeah. And he's like, Yeah, they do that. Um, <laughs> uh, but going on from there, he has a, he wrote, he wrote an anthology series um, called Hotel, spelled H O T E L L, uh, which is a horror anthology series set in a, a motel on Route 66. Um, ah. it, it's, it's phenomenal. Everyone should check it out. It was one of the four launch titles for AWA Upshot. Which was effectively John breaking America. It was um, so he he got to be one of the first four titles of AWA's Upshot um, Upshot, 
which is a major new publishing company headed by former Marvel editors Axel Alonso and Bill Jemis. So yeah, to be one of the the, the flagship titles of a new comic series, mm-hmm. uh, of a new comic company is pretty amazing. And in 2021, one again, one of my favourite books, he launched uh, The Crimson Cage, which is a retail of Shakespeare's Macbeth, which is set against the backdrop of the 1980s territorial system in a uh, territorial system of pro wrestling in, in the southern states of the United States of America. This is brilliant. It's really, really good. Yeah. Um, yeah um, just really good. John's writing makes you feel every emotion. I've cried, but I've also punched the air in triumph reading the same book. Just really, really good. Um, everyone should be checking out John Lee's stuff. If you're particularly, if you're, I think particularly if you're Scottish, there's just, there's, there's something, uh, there's just something, you, there's a unique voice in there that mm-hmm. I think I say that, but then John's told me that like his, his work's really popular in certain, at certain parts of uh, the United States, like right. particularly Sink in particular, he says he's got a bit of a cult following in the Northeast of the United States, despite the oh, fact awesome. that it's a very Glaswegian book series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah often and also i have to hand it there but he um he has referred to us and it's on the back of the brugaders anthology he has referred to us as scotland's premier beer and comics podcast <laughs> congratulations cheers man <laughs> when your favorite <laughs> when your favorite comic one of your favorite comic writers remarks that you're you're doing quite good for the this pretty good um yeah. that was our top 10 i will post them up on the list for folk to debate um if your favorite comic book was a comic book writer wasn't there, let me know. If you want me to do our list and want me to include certain people or omit certain people, let me know. Um, but yeah, that for us was ten names that I, I collectively. If I, I, you know, there was a couple in there that I just wanted to put in because they're my favorites. But mm-hmm. um, and I googled shit. I um, we asked the question on Facebook. We talked about it on the group chat, and that was the ten names that kind of. I felt could be highlighted without anybody kicking the shit out of me. So there you go. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Next week, really I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to do breweries <laughs> or something okay. to that effect. Something I, I, was, I was worried in case you're like, right, sure, you're, you're turn for the list next week. And I would come up and say, right, uh, the, the 10 best beers in my fridge. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want, to, I want next week's to be beer orientated. So let me have we think. I'm thinking breweries or beer styles or whatever. But um, okay, yeah, yeah, like looking at maybe Scottish breweries or Scottish, or, Scottish or, breweries or, is yeah, good. Yeah, because yeah. awesome. they're they're we're kind of blessed when it comes to to craft beer in Scotland. So maybe blessed a bit strong, but we're lucky. We we get we quite lucky. a lot of great craft beer from breweries in Scotland. So. Yeah, let's do that. That sounds good. Scottish breweries. Mm. Let's make that happen. Um, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? It's an hour and 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I, originally I had no interest in this new Ant Man movie. Yeah. But my God, when I see these trailers, <laughs> I feel like I need to see what happens. Yeah, I want to see it too. Wait, yeah. chat for 20 seconds. I'm. Desperate for a wee. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about Ant Man, <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. I mean, it's uh, there's even just the music in the trailer. There's just something about it. it gets stuck in my head, and I'm not sure if it's just this this sound of dread that comes. Like I feel like that last trailer of Ant Man they put out really kind of puts Scott Lang in a difficult situation where it's like, God, it looks like they're ready to kill him off. So. I, I'm really looking forward to it. It's almost like a film I feel like I cannot take my children to, depending on where it goes. So it doesn't feel as sort of family friendly. It just has this overbearing sense of dread. But uh, Jeff will probably want to talk about that with me. Um, would it be cheeky if I just promoted my own things here? Um, if, if you enjoy my uh, unfortunate banter, look up the Lager Logs on YouTube. We've just let out the latest episode of Beer Wars, which is a competitive beer shopping show. But, yeah, there you go. <laughs> nice. Look, talk about Ant-Man, I'm like, yeah, so uh, check it I'm out. I'm just going to have to promote my own show because I thought, I'm giving away all of my talking points, so no, I'll, I'll just promote myself. 
No, go for it. Um, but was, yeah, I um certainly felt in that last. I think the adverts for it is kind of could hear you chatting yeah. there when you when you um the first couple of trailers were more like for I think maybe the first series the first trailer did that whole thing that all the Marvel trailers do where they're like ha 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 this is quite funny who you got yeah. mistaken for Spider Man then bang yes. drama um mm-hmm. the one thing I didn't and I I was I was less quite disappointed with this when I went to the last Spider Man film I hope that like they keep doing this thing in the more recent Marvel movies where they um where the the crisis is set up by one of the heroes. I don't want right. to do that. Like I, I want my superheroes to respond to nah, things that yeah. are already. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas like obviously the the crisis in Spider Man was his deal at doing. The crisis in Multiverse of Madness was Scarlet Witches. Yeah. Um, I want. Um, I suppose in Eternals it was kind of theirs as well. It was the guy that created them was also the guy that was going to destroy the world and right. All that kind okay. of stuff. And I'm like, actually, I want a, uh, I want my superheroes to respond to outside threats, and I hope they. But yeah, I definitely thought the the, the last trailer for Ant Man was quite intriguing. With the, mm-hmm. it looks like they're going to be given Scott the option to rewrite history somewhat. Yeah, yeah. I because that's it. I initially it kind of said something like. Do you want to get get that five years back from your daughter? You obviously loved her as a wee kid, and now she's a grumpy teenager. Yeah, we could rewrite that. That you've, and of course, like his daughters come up with some sort of piece of technology that just sucks them all into the yeah, quantum, quantum realm, <laughs> and Bill Murray's in there for no fucking reason whatsoever. <laughs> or is he? Because it's Bill Murray. So yeah, then. exactly. So I mean. It might make sense, but it's just always so fucking jarring to suddenly see him. It looks like he's he's walking up to a bar in the middle of an Ant Man trailer for some reason. But <laughs> um, the film looks bonkers. Like, yeah. Whilst the multiverse of madness was pretty crazy, but they all do themselves. Like this Ant Man movie. Like whilst Ant Man always feels like a B level or like a B tier. A Marvel movie, and then when is it right? When it's now Ant Man and the Wasp for the sequel, mm-hmm. and that kind of well, that's it's that doesn't happen to your A tier superhero, they don't lump another name onto it. Um, and now this one, this looks like the most epic, yeah. Like this looks to the scale of like an Avengers movie, but it's just down to the three of them, or yeah. And and then everyone's gonna have to find out about Kang. Like, I, I don't know enough about him. I know like he shows up at the end of the Loki TV series, yeah, but yeah. now he's here. Like, if this is like obviously they would like you to have watched Loki before seeing Ant Man, but I imagine there's still gonna be enough information yeah. in Ant Man to explain exactly who he is and why we should be worried about him. Because I, I actually do it. You, 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 even Loki, you can tie up who, you know, it's uh, it's somebody that control, you know, each multiverse con- it has the, this guy, um, the one from the, the the mainline Marvel Universe is this, you know, the, these guys have got the ability to control their multiverse. He has protected his mm. because he's quite nice, but there's other versions of himself that are probably not quite nice. Yes. Uh, and then and then that's it, isn't it? So the, the ah, Kang, the Kang is effectively one of the bad ones. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it looks like that's who's going to be showing up. And I've seen loads of stuff. It's quite interesting. I, I don't. I try not to look too much into it because folk will tear these trailers apart and be like, "Oh, look, there's yes. this guy. There's this guy." And I've seen that. Like, there's there's nods to other villains. Um, yeah, aye, aye. So I, I'm, I'm I'm quite happy to just. It's not long away, is it? It's like a couple of weeks. No, it's so. February. Yeah, it's it's like this time next month we'll have seen it, yeah, well, or, cool. or have the ability to see it. So, but That's no, cool. I, I'm excited to see it. I, I, I quite like the frequency that we're getting Marvel movies now. I know, like folk have got different mm. varying opinions on that, but it's like every three or four months now. So, yeah, I and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing like a new Guardians movie. That's I feel like that's this summer. Yeah. Like I like that cast of characters, so I'm excited to see where the story goes. Again, I feel it's also kind of got like a sense of dread to it. Yeah, I think so. It's almost kind of that thing where 
that the, the Marvel movies don't look as uh, happy go lucky as they used to. They're almost kind of getting that DC sense of overbearing dread in their stories. But that, that's probably the thing for me. And obviously, Ant Man, you said it yourself, he's like a B level character, particularly Ant Man and the Wasp was like a really silly movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, it's interesting that if you put them, that you then put that character into a really like you serious know, story. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm quite excited to see that. And I think the um, guardians are quite good at that as well. Like you put these goofy characters into something quite dark, and it's a good place for them to. It's it's quite cool to explore how that's that kind of character exists in those spaces. Mm. Um, I'm excited for that. Um, I've not seen like I've I've not been to the, the cinema since I, I, I went to see. Um, Wakanda Forever. I've not been seeing Avatar in that, so I think I'm a Wasp will probably be my next movie. I've totally yeah. like we we talked about this last week. I'm not, I've totally fallen back in love with cinema and programs, and you know, mm-hmm. I, I went on a, a fucking humongous Star Trek deep dive and finished right. finished Strange New Worlds and Discovery over Christmas. <laughs> and, like, I think I finished the last one last week. Um, I, I mentioned at the start one of my favorite TV programs ever is that seventy show. Like oh proper, yeah yeah. So proper like um, a, a proper American sitcom. You mentioned John Lithgow mm-hmm. earlier. I would say from Thirty Rock from the Sun. Same writers as Thirty oh. Rock, Third Rock from the Sun. Uh, okay. Um, after they did Third Rock, they moved on to that '70s show. Um, mm-hmm. So very very similar sense of humor. The this the same writing team but are back for that '90s show which started on Netflix today. Oh um, yeah, I saw the notification from my Netflix actually. I watched, so I watched episode one just before um, about seven o'clock tonight. Before we came to air, mm-hmm. I watched the first episode, and it's interesting. Like, um, yeah, I, I, I'll probably take a few till like me. I don't know. You come to accept the characters. It's, it's good that they've got the parents. It's not like a completely new family. Yeah, but the fact it's got the same mum and dad, like that, that's like like a yeah, good so- a good foundation to build from. Well, they're yeah, they're they're like the main characters effectively. Uh, them and um, if you watch episode one, like I don't want to spoil too much, but episode one it break, introduces quite a lot of the original cast just to set a stage uh-huh. quo. Yeah, so um, it's good. It's good fun. Um, but obviously, the, the whole series is revolving around the idea that um, Kitty and Red have are are looking after um, Eric and Donna's daughter for the summer, and so okay, and that's it. It's just her. Uh, it's her. It's her experiences of Point Place. Yeah. Um, but there's been. I don't want to spoil too much. But like the the first. It's only like thirty minutes an episode. It's totally harmless. No. It, it does feel like totally actually quite odd. Like I, I was watching it, and I was they're going like aesthetically, and it's the same set. It's the Foreman House. Is the whole episode set oh, in the House? And um, it looks and feels like an old episode of that '70s show. Yeah. Um, Obviously, like it's set in the nineties, so instead of like instead of references to seventies pop culture, there's references to nineties. This is it. Yeah. This is shit we know. So yeah, yeah. so I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed. It. I'm, a, I'm going to watch the whole thing. As I watched the first episode, I laughed at it a couple of times. A yeah. couple of times, I was like, oh, "That's not that funny." But actually, I felt like that about the normal seventies show. <laughs> to be yeah. honest, particularly the later seasons, it felt like a sort of mid to late season episode of that seventies show. Um, yeah, cool. well, I'm just gonna keep going, and I think it's only ten episodes, so yeah, it's not doing the network. Get through it in no time. Do you ever used to buy like an American series or box set, and it was like twenty five episodes over five discs or whatever? Yeah, that was like when you, I used to try and watch like the CW's Arrow, and there's like my god, there's like thirty episodes of this. Yeah, and it's a bit it's much more filler, it's long. Yeah, yeah like, it was a, it became a proper chore to watch. Yeah. But then, like, I remember Daredevil first came out, and I was like, "Oh, twelve episodes! That's brilliant! It's half mm-hmm. a, it's half in the CW show." Even then, that's a bit of a slog. I'm like, "No, no, like, yeah. we don't, need, we don't need to be doing these twelve. Give me lots of six episode series of different stuff rather than yeah. one." Because, like, I say, an, a season of the Flash is like six months. <laughs> I know. That's it. God, but yeah. like, that's it. another huge show that kind of debuted this week is The Last of Us. Yeah. And that that uh, that's a nine episode run, which is good. It's it's kind of like not too little and not too much. But that opening episode's like an hour twenty minutes. It's a movie, so, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Exactly. So uh, I don't expect it to be like that each week, but 
they, they, they've nailed it. I really enjoyed what they've done. And God, you could almost do like a side by side comparison to like the PlayStation game on oh, yeah. how, like, just the use of dialogue and some how some uh, scenes are, are like set up in frames. It's yeah. really just nailed it. So I am, um, I, I feel like a total poser when I'm watching them. Um... I've not watched the, the the Last of Us. I've not played the game, but right. it's one of those things that's so universally beloved by everybody that's engaged with it. Mm-hmm. That I'm like, and like, from my understanding, just by kind of keeping an eye on things this week, is uh, the critical reception for yeah, the last aye. Week. like everybody seems to be loving it. Right, review re- mm. review websites that I I read for other things are like just giving it four or five stars and fans of the game are like oh my god this is per- totally perfect and i feel like i'm missing out um but i don't know anything about the last of us it just looks a bit like the walking dead to me <laughs> I, well that's i was telling that to my wife where it's like walking dead finished last year like a lot of people that are kind of lost looking for like there's a void in their life if people follow that show religiously they will jump on this because yeah. it's kind of got that that set and the tone to it, the 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 threat yeah. of like these these creatures. But me and my wife, <clears throat> I played through the games, but as I almost made my wife sit there and watch them with me because it was like you were playing through a film. Yeah, and you would just see like the stress that would come. Like the second game, playing through that last year, like absolute, I would be frozen in my chair with some. Sh- moments where you'd be going through a forest and then there's like a whistle and there's enemies and you don't know where they are and the absolute panic like you're yeah. just kind of sat absolute palm sweating with a controller like you have to take a break so you can actually calm down and play and just let it go on so the fact that we're seeing it as a series now it's very exciting oh cool no, that's a good one um yeah I probably will watch the series. Is it? Is it? Pe- is it Pedro? Who's the main guy in it? Is it? It's not Pedro, is it? Like uh, Pedro Pascal. Yeah, yeah it's Pedro. I, I, I saw. I saw. Still, this is how I touch him. Come Pedro, because um, because I, I watched the the. That's a nice name, and I watched the mm. Mandalorian, so I'm like, oh, it's Pedro. <laughs> right. Um, I'm gonna have to wrap up. Unfortunately, there's, there's yeah, some stuff going on here. Um, but take it easy, pal. Take it easy. But right, guys, enjoy. Um. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week where we've got Tony Foster of Comic Scene and we'll be talking about um, our favourite Scottish breweries as a a new list. Stay safe, drop messages. I love you. Bye.